So, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I will start to thank our our leader, Dr. Pedro Ivo, uh, our director, Dr. Janino Onuki, and our boss, Professor Ari Plonski. And uh, of course, I would like also uh, to thank Dr. Mar Marga Soler uh, for offering this lecture before the Inside the School. The Inside School will start tomorrow. So it's, it's, uh, we had to, today a lecture from Indian Foreign Policy from Professor Dateshi. Uh, now we're going to have a, a lecture about science diplomacy as a career. And after that, uh, Dr. Pedro Ivo, you offer an introduction about uh, science diplomacy and innovation diplomacy. So, uh, Dr. Dr. Mar Marga Soler is Senior Project Director of AAAS, Center for Science Diplomacy. She is pioneer in developing science diplomacy education approach, approaches, having trained thousands of leaders all over the world. Since 2016, she is youngest member appointed to Research Innovation and Science Exper Experts High Level Group to European Commission Carlos Moedas, providing direct advice on the science diplomacy strategy for the European Union. So it's a, it's a pleasure. I pass the, the, the floor to Professor Ari Plonsky that will talk a, li a little bit about the course. Thank you, Professor. Uh, thank you very much. I must begin by saying that. Uh, I have good memories of the time when I was the youngest member of something. <laughs> uh, I am here in two positions. First, as uh, not the boss, obviously not, but the host. Uh, this is the Institute of Advanced Studies of University of São Paulo. As you know, uh, this concept of Institute of Advanced Studies began in the third in Princeton in the United States, but the Princeton Institute of Advanced Studies is an uh, institution, uh, an autonomous institution, institution by itself. Uh, 50 years ago began a different phenomenon, which is uh, institutes of advanced studies connected to universities. So you have in the world lots of institutes for advanced studies which are not connected to universities and institutes which are connected to the universities. So these uh, institutes uh, have a network called UBS, University-Based Institutes of Advanced Studies, and the institute in Sao Paulo, University of Sao Paulo, is one of these uh, institutes. We were created in 1986 uh, when Professor Goldenberg was a rector and he wanted to do two things, interdisciplinarity and internationalization, and we were created and we are around. And uh, particularly, we are very happy because uh, our really he's the boss, the Institute of Advanced Studies, and uh, Professor Janina is the boss of the boss, the super boss, <laughs> is the dean of the school, International Institute of International Relations. It really began as a seat in the Institute of Advanced Studies. A group began some 20 years ago discussing what the university, how the university could uh, be present or more present in the international arena. From that, a group was created, CASINCI is an acronym which is, exists until now, a, a, a group to study uh, international aspects, but from the point of view of more uh, conjunctural aspects, more uh, discussion, discussions. And from that, from the seat, the Institute of International Relations was created, and it, we are very proud in the university to have this institute present. Professor Janina, Professor Amancio, thank you for this partnership. Uh, the, as probably uh, you heard, uh, or most of you heard, uh, we are going to have uh, a joint uh, activity led by Institute of International Relations, and we are happy to be partners, uh, which is uh, school, Advanced School for uh, Science and Diplomacy and, and Innovation Diplomacy. On the other hand, and secondary, uh, Professor Alberto Pfeiffer and myself, we created four years ago a graduate course in the business school at that time, Professor Alberto Pfeiffer was a visiting professor at the Institute of International Relations, uh, focusing something that the university does, 
but what uh, was not uh, present, which is uh, focusing on science, technology, and innovation on the international aspects, international dimension. So we created uh, this course, and it was, I think, pretty uh, well attended and successful, mainly because the students were great. We had also uh, good partners in this course. And now this course is offered, as you know, in the fourth edition. And by a very happy coincidence, we have this four edition, which began two weeks ago of the course, uh, basically uh, together in two weeks with this advanced school on science and innovation diplomacy. So uh, we are using the opportunity, firstly, uh, Professor Amansi was with you and uh, explained what was going to happen. Second, uh, he was so kind to open the open parts of the insight to the students of this course. And uh, number three, we are having this uh, hors d'oeuvre, intellectual hors d'oeuvre with Dr. Marga Soler and Dr. Pedro Ivo, uh, who will uh, uh, provide us a very important aspect, which uh, Professor uh, Amancio already presented, which is science diplomacy as a career. And as probably some of you at least might consider this uh, track in, in life, I think it will be also not only intellectually, but also personally extremely interesting. So thank you very much for the opportunity. So, Marga, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor. Muito obrigada. Um, thank you, Professor Amantia, Professor Janina, and all the organizers of this very important, very timely initiative to bring science diplomacy to this institute, and most importantly, to Brazil. This is not my first time in Brazil, but it's my first time at the University of Sao Paulo. So I'm really excited to get to know you and the institution, and I know many of you will not be in the course, um, so I have a, a, it is a real pleasure to have a chance to, to be with you today for a little bit. You will notice that I come very colorful. I come from the summer. I didn't have my winter clothes with me, <laughs> and so I feel a little bit out of, out of place, but it is what it is. I escaped the heat wave in, in Spain, um, but it's, an, it's a nice, refreshing, week that uh, we're going to have here. Maybe the, the, the rain is not so nice, but um, I'm, I'm happy to, to break from summer a little bit. Um, so this uh, group here is probably most of the, 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 your background is from international relations. And uh, when I was studying, I am a biologist, I am a scientist. I never came across anybody from an international relations uh, field. So I did my whole studies in biology, molecular biology, protein biology, biomedical sciences, and I never came across anybody that could talk to me about the implications, the international security diplomacy uh, development dimensions and implications of science. And so it is so important that you're here and that the school is um, really being established at this time more than ever. And so I hope to walk you a little bit through my own career in science diplomacy, which is very winding and non-traditional, um, but also to maybe look at the, the recent history of science diplomacy through the projects and initiatives that I've been privileged to be part of uh, over the last uh, seven or eight years since I uh, embarked in this really adventurous path. Um, so, a disclaimer I always make when I speak to diplomats, I am not a diplomat, I don't have training in diplomacy formally. So sometimes I am a little bit vague with words and, and I hope you will forgive me and we can have a discussion about it. So um, first I want to ask if anybody here is a, is, a, is a trained scientist or a natural scientist in the strict sense, because we also have the discussion whether everything is a science, right? Political science is a science. Uh, but we tend to still divide the natural science, the social science, and law, and, and all of it um, in, in separate buckets. But I think what we have here is, is really the, the, the need of bringing all the disciplines together. So you spoke about interdisciplinarity and transdisciplinarity. So I will try to illustrate in practice how this looks like. What, what are the real life examples of, of projects and initiatives that bring really the scientists and the diplomats together and other actors to advance uh, common goals? So let's see if this works. Yeah. 
Um, so this is my path. Um, I was asked, Professor Amantio um, told me to, to speak a little bit about my own, my own way here, how I got here. And so, first of all, you know, science is a very international career. Everything uh, is about uh, working with where the best uh, collaborators you can find, where the best equipment, research facilities uh, exist in the world. So scientists tend to not consider so much the uh, geographical or the um, you know borders in in all in all in all sense of the word, because what they look for is to generate knowledge, and they collaborate with whoever in the world has the ability to to provide or help uh, construct that that knowledge. And so science is a international uh, venture by nature, and so taking advantage of that, uh, as scientists, we we begin going around the world sometimes without. Um, uh, a destination, and and end up with career paths that are really not are really random. It really do, that doesn't make sense because you can't plan certain um, aspects of it. So I I am from Spain. I grew up in 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 Mallorca, which is a little island in the Mediterranean, and I quickly um, left to Barcelona, which I did my studies my my degrees in and masters in in biology in molecular biology, and then in a turn of things after the financial crisis of 2008. I wanted to do a PhD, but I felt in Spain things were not going well in terms of funding for research and the opportunities that I would have if I would decide to stay in my country for a PhD. So in a very natural thing to do, scientists move around, I decided to move around and leave my country for Australia. So I ended up in Melbourne and I did uh, half of my master's there and then I, I accepted a PhD in Brisbane, which is a city in the in the eastern coast of Australia, a wonderful place where I learned to scuba dive and surf, but I also I learned to do research and and got a PhD. So um, it's always nice to find places that combine, um, I think, the the intellectual fulfillment, but also some of the fun and the life uh, that that is necessary. Otherwise, you go crazy. Those of you that are doing a PhD or did one, you know what I'm talking about, and. As I was going through my PhD, I was using my um, fluorescent microscopy to look at cells. And this required me to be in a dark room alone for hours at a time, sometimes 12 hours, sometimes 24 hours, without speaking to anyone, without going out of that room. And I realized that the point of science was really not that one. I wanted to share, I wanted to engage, I wanted to uh, see how science could be applied and of use and of benefit of, of society, of the world, of innovation. And I felt very lonely and I felt like science should be a more collaborative endeavor and should be a more society, you know, societally applied uh, exercise and I was not finding that. So I decided after my PhD to leave um, academia and to leave laboratory research. And this, there's nothing wrong with being in academia, but I thought there's so many people that are doing this path, the traditional path from PhD to postdoc to assistant professor, and maybe, maybe one day you will get tenure and you'll get a, a place in the university, but most people don't get that today, right? So I thought, why there are no other opportunities for scientists outside of academia? What else could I, can I do with this science? What else can I um, be use or be helpful with this scientific training. So I um, landed in, in New York. So I went to the United Nations for an internship. At the time, the internships were only uh, typically taken by students of international relations or uh, political science or law, or if you were just the daughter or the son of a diplomat um, that had some influence in the, in the UN. But when I applied to be an intern in the United Nations, they told me we never had a scientist here. And, and they were worried that I would be overqualified, but also that I would be bored. Like, what are you going to do here? This is, you know, intern's job is to make photocopies and name tags and arrange the room and bring the coffee. Maybe, maybe some of you have done internships at the UN. <laughs> and so I was, you know, I was challenged by the lack of but the lack of confidence of that person that I had a place in there. So I, I wrote back and I said, look, th this, was, this was 2012. It was the year the MDGs, or the Millennium Development Goals, were going to 
transition into the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals. And all of it was about water and about health and about biodiversity and about oceans. It was all about science. And they were telling me they didn't have scientists in, the, in that building. So I, was, I wanted to prove them wrong. And I said, OK, how about if the day has eight hours, you let me do for half of the day whatever I want. And then the other half of the day, I will do whatever you need me to do, whether it's making coffee or photocopies or arranging conference rooms and name tags. So we had a deal. So I went to New York, and I decided to, to apply what I could do best, which was research, right? I was a researcher. I had a PhD. What I knew was how to find and collect and analyze and publish and write information. And so out of that experience, in six months, I wrote a report. And the, the report was, what are the roles for scientists at the United Nations? Um, and so it was a very eye-opening experience for me because I, I realized that so many people were in that position. So many students and early career scientists wanted to find pathways to work at the UN, to work in, in, in the governments in different places of the administration. But they were just not provided any, any resources or guidance. So it was really this black box. Um, and I thought, maybe I can open some light to, to, for others to, to also join in this space. And in the end, it was about the divide, the gap between science and the, the world of international diplomacy and, and, and policy and, and politics and everything. And of course, that was so exciting that I stayed there. I never went back to, to the lab. I never went back to academia. And I've been since in this limbo, which is a little bit in there, but not uh, fully. Um, and so after the New York, I moved to Washington, D.C. And, and as uh, Professor, Professor uh, mentioned, I joined AAAS. AAAS is an organization that publishes uh, the, the um, journal Science. It's, it's best known um, because of that journal, right? One of the best scientific journals in the world. But one of the lesser known aspects of this organization is that they have an entire programmatic arm that does science engagement with a number of uh, parts of society. So science communication, science policy, science and human rights, science and religion, and of course science and diplomacy. So each of the um, topics has a center, and I was part of the Center for Science Diplomacy. Um, so at that time, that was 2014, I was a newly minted PhD in biology with an internship at the UN. And I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do. So I show up at the Center for Science Diplomacy in Washington, DC, and ask, what do they do? And so they started explaining to me something about this picture. So who can tell me, who can recognize what's going on in these photos? Only by the picture of the year. It's not a very high resolution, so it's OK if you don't know. <laughs> So, so the 2002 is President Bush at the State of the Union. The 2002 State of the Union, there was an important n announcement or coining of a new term, which was some countries that were not friendly to the US, and they were labeled as the axis of evil. Six years later, Obama. I'm not going to explain to you because you know exactly what the axis of evil is and what happened there. But six years later, President Obama arrives and decides that he wants to rewrite the narrative of engagement with some of these countries. These countries were Cuba, North Korea, Iran, Syria. And the idea of science diplomacy for the US government and for many others around the US government from the non-governmental sector really starts here. Some people at the State Department that were scientists, that were placed by AAAS actually to do fellowships in the, in the government, decide that this term of science diplomacy has always existed, but it needs to be officialized. It needs to be um, given a framework, a definition, to, to be able to use it, right? So we all know that there are relations between science and diplomacy for centuries. But we didn't have the tools and the language and the academic definitions or frameworks to describe it. So three people in the State Department in the US in 2008 decided to found this Center for Science Diplomacy in conjunction with 
the new narrative of President Obama launched in 2008. And now you know what 2008 is. What is this picture? Still no? Okay, Cairo, yeah. This is the Cairo speech. President Obama goes to the university and announces that there will be a new narrative to the relationship between the US and these countries from the axis of evil, many of them Muslim countries. And he announces that science and technology will be a major tool for engagement, a diplomatic tool that will try to overcome some of these divides, some of these uh, very strong political, ideological uh, divides that had dominated the previous administration under, under Bush. And so that's what's going on in Washington, 2008. President Obama announces new narrative for engagement using science and technology with countries that were enemies before. And then the non-governmental ecosystem around the government starts to jump into this idea. And one of them is AAAS, and that's how the Center for Science Diplomacy begins. It's the first center that's created with this name. And in 2009, they partner with the Royal Society in London, which is the, the scientific society of the UK, and they write the first report that describes this word, this term, the label science diplomacy, appears here for the first time in 2010. It's called New Frontiers in Science Diplomacy. It's a very basic, very short report, but really is the first time that tries to put, it, put down the definition and um, make science diplomacy more uh, operational, something that you can teach, something that you can uh, do. And the definition that they find for it is very simple, it's science used as a common ground or a common language to build partnerships, to manage common resources and address sh shared challenges, and importantly, to use it for improving diplomatic relations, as we've seen with the Obama Cairo speech. And so this report contains very classic examples. So the Antarctic Treaty is one of the first and most classic examples of using science for as a diplomatic tool, and, and in fact, uh, we know that in, in 1959, Antarctica was declared to be only a place governed by science and not a place for territorial claims or for nuclear tests or for any kind of resource extraction. And other uh, examples that are described in this report, the Montreal Protocol, which is a very successful treaty that really stops the um, CFC emissions that cause the ozone layer hole. And it is interesting that some of the most successful treaties um, that have been achieved in history have been about environment, about science, and that tells you something about the not relatively easy, everything is difficult to agree on, but science is often a place where countries can agree on even though they are in, in perhaps uh, political odds or, or, or other type of, of disputes. So science is emerging as this language that can be uh, used to first overcome um, different political challenges. And AAAS in 2010 provides this first definition or framework uh, to, to try to make it more mainstream in the end. So that's uh, 10 years ago, right? And so what we've seen in the last 10 years, since that first uh, attempt to conceptualize science diplomacy is, of course, we are in the 21st century and we have globalization in which um, everything crosses borders and all types of borders, uh, spatial, temporal, cognitive. Um, and then we start being aware of climate change. In the last 10 years, we really understand that climate change is going to change completely our geopolitical landscape and we can no longer think about diplomacy or uh, geopolitics without uh, considering climate change and all of its consequences and, and problems that creates for foreign policy like migration or food insecurity, water shortages, water wars, health problems, and all sorts of instabilities um, that are derived from, from climate change. And so all of these new diplomacies start to emerge and science diplomacy is only one of the many, right? And, and, and this is something you know very well. And now everything is a diplomacy, health diplomacy, and internet, and cyber, and nuclear, and disaster diplomacy. And, and a lot of it will be covered in the, in the course this week. But importantly, there is 
this idea of diverse actors coming into the, in the, into the picture. And scientists and science is one of those stakeholders that are um, starting to, to, to gain um, importance um, in both the, the formal diplomacy and also the um, uh, track to and other um, informal, formal and informal um, types of diplomatic engagement. And we find that because science is central to all of the challenges we deal with today, and speaking of the SDGs and of course the UN agenda now, it's all about that, right? And, and science is what we need to understand the problems. And um, we have a lot of solutions that are going to also require science and technology to, to not just understand but to implement as well. And, and then everything is transboundary, right? So the, the interdisciplinarity that we were talking about in the beginning, um, we need an academic system that matches the real world problems because if us at the university don't speak to each other between our disciplines, then we can never understand together the problem. The problem is a multifaceted, multidimensional, multidisciplinary problem, but we still remain the chemist with the chemist and the mathematicians with the mathematician and the political science with the political scientists. So places like this are exactly what's needed to tackle um, some of this, most of these challenges. And obviously the international dimension because none of the challenges can be solved by one nation, country, sector or discipline alone. And so in my own experience, I had the privilege to specialize in the Latin America engagement. So for AAAS, um, because I spoke Spanish and because I, I knew the region, I was tasked with developing the relations with Latin America and especially with Cuba as part of this um, first mentioned uh, new narrative with these countries, right? You know, the US and Cuba uh, are the last Cold War um, vestige and up until 2015, they did not have diplomatic relations for more than 50 years. And so in 2014, I started working with Cuba before the normalization. And the story is a, a little bit of a case study that I, I will also uh, cover on the, on the course, but I thought it would be interesting to share with you because it comes from the realization that the United States and Cuba are so close and share so many challenges that it really is in the best interest of both nations to engage for the benefit of their citizens and populations. So health problems are common, mosquito-borne disease, mosquitoes travel back and forth, hurricanes, they come first to the Caribbean and then go up to the US and Florida, and there's no communication between the meteorological agencies in both countries. So then when something happens, both countries lose. The same with oceans and currents and marine ecosystems and coral reefs and shark populations. Being 90 miles away means that these two countries are losing by not engaging on the issues that affect them both, regardless of the political situation. Of course, this is easy to say and hard to do because you can never leave the politics aside. That doesn't exist. But this provides arguments for more opening and more dialogue uh, because of the shared challenges and, and the benefit that both countries will have uh, to engage. So we went to Cuba in 2014 to sign the first agreement, the first MOU that was signed between any institution in the US and Cuba. And it was a scientific one. So again, science is one of the easy gateways to understanding when other doors are closed. And we've, we signed this agreement to focus on what the two countries found more pressing issues affecting them both. And those were three. There's, those were um, infectious disease and this uh, idea that mosquitoes travel back and forth and they can affect, bring disease to both countries. Neuroscience, because there were very similar patterns of dementia, Alzheimer's, and the US and Cuba shared a very uh, similar profile in terms of aging and, and, and how the disease progresses in both countries. And then cancer, because they also, there's also a very similar profile. And Cuba had a very good um, cancer research system. And it turned out that the US thinks that they have the best science in the world and the best 
uh, drugs and the best everything, but there were a few things that Cuba had that, um, that the U.S. did not, certain drugs for cancers. And so it was really in the best interest for both countries to work together and to engage at least scientifically. Uh, and so we began a program uh, to, to bring scientists from the U.S. to Cuba and, and to Cuba to, to the U.S., from Cuba to the U.S., to share techniques, to, to, bring, to give the Cuban scientists access to some of the equipment that they could not have because of the economic and trade embargo. There are so many scientific equipment that Cuba cannot buy because um, the embargo dictates that there, if a company has a participation from the U.S., even if it's a subsidiary or uh, anything, this uh, company cannot sell to Cuba. And pretty much every pharmaceutical company or scientific company these days has a participation from the United States. And that really prevents Cuba from getting um, advanced equipment. For instance, they did not have an MRI machine until 2009, and it had to be donated by the Netherlands. And so this um, engagement was very difficult because um, we, at that time, we did not have flights, commercial flights between the two countries. We had to charter planes from Miami. We, had to, we could not use any federal money, so no U.S. federal dollars could go to Cuba. So we had to rely on philanthropy and donors and all sorts of non-governmental um, funding. And this is all to say that the practicalities and the logistics of science diplomacy that are not sexy, nobody likes to talk about, are actually the major barriers. And so when we talk about collaborating between country A and country B and how wonderful it would be to bring them together and blah, 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 we forget that doing one meeting can take two years. One meeting that brings 10 people from each side can, can take two years and thousands and thousands of dollars. And so you know, science diplomacy is a very practical thing that you have to consider that you are up against all sorts of challenges. We have also done programs with North Korea, um, with Iran, with Syria, with Myanmar, and just the logistics of doing anything. It, it even it almost removes you. I mean, it it, it stops uh, you from even think wanting to do more because that one trip already leaves you exhausted, and you realize how difficult it is, and it doesn't get better. So, um, this is to really, I think. It's a reality check. So science diplomacy sometimes sounds very sexy and it looks very cool, but then when you go into the day-to-day -day logistic, it is exhausting. And not to mention if you have to apply for uh, some license. So we were lucky that none of the research we were doing was dual use or anything. So we could go under a general license, which means scientists can go and they can just basically declare that they are not doing anything suspicious. But if you want to bring certain type of equipment, then you have to request a license and you have to get lawyers and everybody involved. It's very, very expensive. And so when countries don't have diplomatic relations, everything is so difficult. And it is really the job of the diplomats to make the, the, the work easy for scientists, right? This is an extreme case, but on an everyday case in normal relations countries, getting visas, getting permits for research, field work, um, sending a sample of DNA to another country. All of this, it's labeled as bureaucracy and scientists don't want to talk about it, but it actually hinders research so much. Um, and that now there's talk of uh, launching special visas and passports for scientists. This is a, a conversation that's happening, first was in Africa, because African scientists always get rejected by, by um, northern counterparts to go to conferences, so they can't just, they just can't go to conferences because of their nationality. And then uh, Brexit. The Brexit conversation is also now bringing this idea of a vi uh, scientific visa only. And then bringing the questions of then who is a scientist and who qualifies and who decides. And then it, it opens a box to so many things. But I think when diplomats study <laughs> and they go to, 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 to their university and then the, the, the foreign ministries and the trainings and the the diplomatic training, they've always told me that this part of facilitating the science was not mainstream in their training. And then the scientists tell me that they never learned how important it was to have the diplomats helping and assisting 
in, 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 in creating these this, uh, international scientific collaborations and networks. And then I realized too that scientists don't even realize that what underpins a scientific facility is actually a diplomatic treaty. So when you have an observatory, like the, the telescopes in Chile, or when you have CERN, a particle physics laboratory, those are diplomatic institutions that have treaties under, underneath them. And scientists don't know that. They go, they, they look at the telescope, they log their hours, and they go home, do the data. But there's a huge diplomatic machine that has to happen before the scientist can go and do her experiment. So that's why I think we need, in both tracks, to learn from each other. And early on, scientists understand what diplomats do and how they are helpful. And, and the diplomats to understand what scientists, very important, they, what, what very important role they have to, to facilitate scientific cooperation. And so this is just the news from yesterday that doesn't even say the date. When you take a screenshot from something that says yesterday, it's now eternal. Um, but all of this work that we did with Cuba is now starting to um, go backwards and because of Trump, right? And so this is also a, a lesson about science diplomacy. It really goes up and down, like the, the political cycles, and science diplomacy goes with it. So I told you at the beginning, Obama, with the Cairo speech and with the new uh, push for science was a very good time to launch a lot of these things. It was a very fertile ground for scientists to want to do science diplomacy and everybody got excited about it. But then administration changes and then you get everything reversed. So a lot of perseverance and a lot of, um, um, I would say, patience. Uh, and also the networks, both inside and outside the government, uh, need to be as stable as possible. And that's why a lot of the non-governmental actors maintain this engagement. And now, because scientists cannot travel anymore, um, Trump, uh, as you know, um, dismantled the um, US embassy in Havana. And now there's no way for them to get visas. They have to go through third countries. It's really not worth it. But we hope that this scientific engagement that we've been able to maintain over the years uh, will not die. And so the next time, hopefully soon, that things go back to like to the, to the way they were, um, these scientists can go back and, and, and start work, working, restart um, their, their work again. So that's the first story. The first story of my, of my work in, in, in science diplomacy. Cuba was an example. But as you've already guessed, one of my interests and I think important needs that we have is how do we train in this field? What does it mean to train in science diplomacy? And that's why we're here. That's why the summer school is so important because it is not enough um, what's uh, already there. There are different places that science diplomacy training can take place. One of them is, of course, the university. But a lot of the training happens in uh, informal education, in professional development, in executive education, and in, of course, foreign ministries and diplomatic academies and international organizations and the UN and, and so forth. And so for us at AAAS, it was very important since the beginning to partner with the Global South because science diplomacy in the beginning of the concept was very North. It was very, you know, it was very US centric. It was all about Cold War stuff, US Soviet Union, US China, US Japan, and there was very little attention to the Global South. So we partnered with the World Academy of Sciences, which is um, a global academy of sciences in Trieste in Italy uh, that has a, a regional office um, in, in Latin America. In, in, I think it's in, in Brazil, actually. It's in Rio. Um, or one of the, the offices is actually here. And what they do is they train scientists from the Global South um, in all sorts of professional development and skills. And one of them was partnering with us to do training in science diplomacy. So every year we've been doing a summer school similar to this one in Trieste, very successful, bringing 40, 50 people from all around the world, and then having them go back to their countries and multiply the effect and organize their own capacity building and training. And many of them are going to be here also tomorrow. So I'm very excited to see them again. That means that we did something good if they came back for more. Um, and then, so we realized that doing one course 
for the whole world was very difficult because the issues are global, but also they are very local. So you need to have a regional contextualization for everything you teach. So it's not the same to talk about water diplomacy in Latin America or in Southeast Asia or in Sub-Saharan Africa, right? Because maybe there are some principles that can, that can be applied to all the scenarios, but in the end, it's about the situation, the political and the scientific and the geographic and the cultural situation that each region um, is experiencing. So we decided to do regional trainings that will focus on the five major uh, geographical areas in the world. So, so far we've done three in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, Middle East and Latin America, the last one we did last year in, in Panama. And this allows for the scientists and the diplomats and the policymakers to come together with a much more and uh, uh, a much easier understanding of each other because they uh, are the same region, they are from the same region and share the same understanding. And then we decided to do the one, so there was one place that there was no size diplomacy happening and it was a little bit um, um, stupid, I would say it was Washington DC. It was the place with the most embassies in the world and the place where a lot of this uh, conversation began but no training was happening there. So we decided to launch a course two years ago um, that is an immersion experience. So taking advantage of being in a capital is always great because you don't need to be in the class all the time. You take the students for uh, field visits. And um, of course, in Washington, uh, every embassy can be a host. They are now fight to be the host, which is good. That means the course is valuable. Um, and also go to, to the World Bank and to all of the uh, international institutions. So it's a very important uh, networking exercise, not just training content, it's also about training skills and teaching network, effective networking, and also con uh, connecting the students with all of these uh, institutions. And so at some point, I was going around the world talking about this all the time, and we were overwhelmed because we couldn't be everywhere. So we decided to record an online course. So this is the first attempt at a one hour introduction to science diplomacy. And uh, I recommend, not I, I hate seeing me in the, in the video because I look like a, a statue, um, but it is, we try to summarize in a more interactive way what was in this initial report that I talked about in, in 2010. Um, many people don't read reports anymore and we find students are increasingly hard to get to do any pre-course uh, reading. They just don't have time or they don't want to, especially the younger ones. And so we thought that a, uh, an interactive video would be a better strategy and it really works. And, and since we have this video out, everybody that comes to the course is already knowledgeable and, and, and understand uh, what we're talking about, but before they just didn't, they say, oh, I will read on the plane and nobody reads on the plane. That's another myth. Um, so I recommend you if you, if you want to learn more and, and explore this topic to, to watch this video. And then this was an attempt to try to bring together all of the institutions that were doing or trying to do science diplomacy training. So in the US, um, two years ago, there was a big push. Many universities started um, developing courses on science diplomacy, some of them without faculty support because, again, being this interdisciplinary weird um, thing, many students didn't find an academic home for pursuing this interest. So they had to do like a self-guided education and take a class in international law and then take another class in uh, international relations and then take another class on environmental policy. But in ways that were not connected by a curriculum yet. So there, there are many universities right now that have student groups and clubs for science diplomacy, and they are creating their own curriculum and they are transferring it to other students, sometimes without faculty involvement. And I thought, oh, that's great, but also it's worrying because that means that the students are going ahead in, in the, they, they are expressing a need, an academic need that's not being fulfilled. And again, that's why I'm so glad that here, the, this university is um, doing this um, science diplomacy initiative because it is really ahead. Many, many places, some of these very big names in their screen are actually behind in, in, in getting this um, 
you know, fulfilling the, the, the um, initiatives or following these the students. And the third part of the work that I want to talk to you is, is, is actually about this part of the world, the one that I enjoy the most, which is Latin America. And it has been the work with the foreign ministries and the diplomatic academies. So in the beginning, science diplomacy was more um, a buzzword or a trend for the scientific community. So we got a lot of interest in the early years from um, universities and graduate students, mostly from the biomedical scientists, so a lot of biologists, a lot of chemists, a lot of physics, a lot of really the engineering, a lot of the, the, the natural or the hard sciences. And we were finding that the, the other side of the coin was not so engaged. And in, in recent years, um, we've seen the opposite trend. We've seen a lot of foreign ministries and a lot of diplomatic academies, especially in Latin America, starting to pick up this concept and wanting to do more. So one of the most visible ones is Panama. So the vice president and foreign minister of Panama, uh, Isabel de Saint Malo. Two years ago, she decided that she wanted Panama to have a science diplomacy strategy, and that is at the highest level. So uh, she created the task force, and I was um, very honored to be part of it, to help Panama think about strategically what science diplomacy could bring them. And in, it was a very interesting exercise to, to walk through what are the strengths of this country? What are the assets, for instance, the ocean, the canal, the geostrategic positioning, uh, the biodiversity? So it was about taking stock of what the country, the what country's biggest strengths for science would be, and then helping position that strategy uh, to make Panama a more attractive partner for scientific collaboration and attract scientific talent from abroad. Um, so it was a very, I think, um, blueprint experience in which now there's a, a little questionnaire that I go and, and other governments are following and I can go through and say, okay, here's what you have to consider when you want to think about science diplomacy. And I'll be, I'll be happy to share that. Um, and then Mexico is another country that has done quite a bit. Uh, we helped um, the Instituto Matias Romero, which is the, the Mexican Diplomatic Academy, develop a course uh, on the fourth industrial revolution for their diplomats. And this course is online and it was um, made part of the um, curriculum for their, their diplomatic, um, I, w I think it's all of the diplomats, not just, not just the new ones, but I'm not sure, but it was, um, it was made part of their um, learnings. And then we've helped um, different countries do different things. The good thing about science diplomacy is that you can engage, there's no protocol, there's no process. You can really engage any stakeholder, any actor, and you can make something new out of it. For instance, in Mexico, our main counter counterpart was the Science Advisory Council to the President, uh, the CCC. It's, it's a um, mix of a academic and, and governmental uh, institution. Um, but then in Chile, we engaged with the Senate, so there was one senator, um, Guido Girardi, who is a doctor, uh, a medical doctor, who wanted to bring this idea of science diplomacy to Chile. And so a lot of the engagement was with the Senate and uh, in, in the legislative side of science diplomacy. And then in Argentina was the Ministry of Science. So, and, you know, and, and then other countries have um, tried to build their, uh, build their own bridges between their own university, their own foreign ministry, and sometimes we went in and helped convene or do a stakeholder mapping uh, of what were the, the strengths of that country in, in science diplomacy. So it is really a versatile tool, right? There's no, uh, there's no formula, there's no recipe, and as long as you have a scientific component and a foreign policy component, you can create and, and really use your creativity to, to implement and to advance this, this idea of science diplomacy in, in, in your country. And of course, the, the, one of the natural places for science diplomacy is ob obviously the, the multilateral world. So in Latin America, UNESCO has been active a little bit from, from Montevideo, from the Science uh, Regional Office in, in Uruguay, and also an institution 
that had a big presence in Brazil, which is the Inter-American Institute for Global Change Research. So it's a, um, an intergovernmental, it's a treaty actually, a treaty organization in the Americas that deals with um, global change, but at the hemispheric level. So it requires integration of the science and uh, the global change and climate change strategies. And it's, it's a very good organization for that too. So the last part, I'm, I'm just going through, if you have any interruption, please feel free. I'm just going through some of the um, experiences. The last part that I'm more engaged right now, um, I'm now in Europe, is um, to help the EU in figuring out what science diplomacy means for them and how can the EU be a stronger scientific actor. Um, as you know, <clears throat> the EU has one of the biggest research budgets in the world and it pretty much collaborates with any country in the world and the funding for research is open to third countries and, and really the EU is built and founded on, on this soft power ideals, right? So science diplomacy was perceived at, uh, in, a few years ago as fitting very nicely with uh, EU values. So the commissioner for science at that time, uh, Commissioner Moedas, 2015, he arrived and decided that he wanted that the EU had a science diplomacy strategy. And this idea of having a strategy is a little bit controversial because there are many countries that have science diplomacy in practice, but they never had an official strategy or an official government communication about it. Um, and it's just simply a, a, a mechanism that they use. And Brazil is one of them. So that there's always been, or for many years, as far as I know, um, and in science department in Itamaraty, right? The, the foreign ministry has embedded science for many years, but I'm not sure or I'm not aware of having an official science diplomacy strategy ever released in that sense. So some countries use this for a little bit of a marketing stunt and then they don't follow up. So not having a strategy doesn't mean that you're not doing it or not publishing a strategy. Um, and, and this is not to criticize anyone, of course, but sometimes, of course, you need the high level push and you need to build support at the highest level and that's great. But if then there's no follow up and there are no instruments and mechanisms and actual um, tangible activities put in place uh, or science diplomacy is embedded in all your thinking of all your ministries, then it really is uh, like, a, like a marketing um, strategy more than anything. So the EU is still searching for the science diplomacy strategy four years later, and I have uh, tried to contribute to that as well. We wrote two books um, matching the idea of the EU being open to the world and being a continent for science. Uh, how does that match with more soft power and, 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 and influence um, strategies? for the EU and also try to think strategically what countries or what parts of the world um, the EU should engage more with science. And one of the examples that they always like to put is one of the also examples that we have in the, in the summer school, which is Sesame. Um, and the EU was a big contributor to, the, to this um, synchrotron uh, in the Middle East that brings together countries that have uh, not the best diplomatic relations uh, between them, but they managed to come together to build a scientific facility uh, in Jordan. And so I am engaged in helping the EU think through this idea of science diplomacy. Of course, it's a very challenging thing to do for a supranational structure because in the EU, research is almost entirely, the, the biggest competence is, is the EU in research. So countries still have their national budgets for research, but the EU budget through Horizon 2020 and, and the framework program is by large the major contributor to EU research. But the foreign policy the, uh, competences are on the member states. And so it is hard to, for, for a supranational structure to match two elements that they don't have equal competences in. And so there is also um, an idea of intra-EU science diplomacy when the EU is at risk of fragmentation or polarization, can science also help internally um, bridge some of those crises of 
for instance, the crisis of European identity and crisis of EU values that are also um, going on right now. So it's both an intra-science diplomacy exercise and then an exercise for the EU as a block to project to, to the external world. And from that vision of Commissioner Moedas in trying to bring science diplomacy into the EU, there were a number of research programs started and also two of them are going to be represented in the summer school tomorrow. Um, two of these three projects are still active and they are consortia, consortia of 10 to 12 European universities, foreign ministries, diplomatic academies, scientific organizations that are coming together to try to think of what, this, what, does, what does a science diplomacy vision for the EU looks like. And I'm, I'm <clears throat> excited to hear um, some of them uh, over the, the next few days. But the, I think bottom line is that more and more countries are trying to embrace this idea of science diplomacy from all aspects, from all sectors, from the government, from the university, from the research enterprise. And there are new creations that are emerging. And I think it is a very exciting time, especially because the global political landscape is not going that direction. It's going on into the opposite direction. So how can we use science and scientific engagement and help science be more present in the political discussions and our decisions be more evidence-based, um, especially when we're talking about our common resources or um, global commons that really need to be managed jointly by all of us, by all countries, or solving global issues like climate change that uh, really cannot be solved if um, not everybody is on board. And so my last project, which I cannot disclose yet, is Brexit. Um, and I am, just a few days ago, I was uh, dealing with some negotiations that are going to be announced soon. It's a mock agreement. It's not real because can't negotiate. <laughs> <laughs> with <laughs> Boris Johnson. <laughs> but um, it's an exercise from British and European non-governmental parties to try to come up with science agreements that will be palatable for both. And, and things are not looking good, but we try. And that's the point. Science diplomacy keeps trying, keeps trying, keeps trying, even in the, in the most adverse conditions. And I hope here you also have the courage to, to do that. So this is boring and I will skip. So the last thing is many people ask how they can build, um, what, so what does it look like a national science diplomacy strategy when we talk about countries wanting to build capacity in science diplomacy? One exercise that I'd like to do that is useful is to look through an ecosystem of science diplomacy domestically. Because science diplomacy starts at home. It is not something that you can do if your foreign ministry doesn't talk to your science ministry. It is like your right hand doesn't talk to your left hand, then you don't know what you're doing. And a lot of the challenges happen because of that. Sometimes science is always you know, going free. Scientists are collaborating without barriers from around the world, and they are not keeping their foreign ministries in the loop. And then you know, it, it is better if all of the actors can um, be coordinated. So there's a, an, an, in the US, we did an exercise to map all, and it's, this is a huge, of course, in the US, there are a million agencies because there are no ministries. So the number of actors really goes out the window. But it is a way for a country to map what, what are my actors, what are my, what are my assets in science diplomacy. And then you can try to match to your, your, the other country or your counterpart. Um, and try to uh, establish these uh, partnerships. And so if you want to know more about how scientists can be involved in diplomacy, we also have another resource, which was a landscape analysis um, that I researched for two years, over 50 countries, um, how they are doing this engagement. So every country is different, there's no formula, but I found a number of very good and I think representative uh, mechanisms and instruments by which science, 
and technology and engineering makes its way into the policy making decision making process and there's a this is a policy in general it is not just foreign policy but there is a chapter only about mechanisms for scientists uh, to engage in diplomacy for instance uh, creating the figure of a science attaché because most countries still don't have science attachés in their embassies they have cultural attachés or economic or others or education but they do not have science attachés yet or they do not have a science office within the foreign ministry like Gita Marati does uh, or they do not have science advisors to the foreign ministries so all of this um, types of instruments and tools are mapped in this report in case you're looking for inspiration in in how you know the institutional innovation that can happen to uh, advance science diplomacy and so I will finish here I will say that science diplomacy is an amazing career mainly because there is no career and you have to make it as you go um, so it is about finding opportunities and making the most and also identifying things that that perhaps are not obvious right and and seeing an opportunity where others just see um, nothing so one of the some some of these examples are uh, science diplomacy meeting in the Vatican uh, science diplomacy meeting on a boat in Italy the mo the second largest boat in Italy um, science diplomacy visit in Antarctica and then a science diplomacy underwater meeting in the Red Sea so these are all very unique opportunities that I don't think I would have had if I had been in the lab in my original uh, career and so I would encourage you all to follow uh, an, un an unusual path because it really brings the rewards that cannot be planned or mapped um, not even in your you know wildest dreams so I would say that this career really goes beyond any any planning or expectations and I would be very happy to um, talk to you or follow up with you I can give you my card if you're interested in knowing more or any of those opportunities that I um, talked about like fellowships internships I can give you all the details if you want to apply workshops all of that I am always happy to to share and, and I hope more people will come into this crazy world of, of science diplomacy um, and so I'll leave you with this which is um, a note that one of my classmates gave me um, seven years ago when I was out of that internship at the UN I went to Georgetown because I found that I had no knowledge of anything other than science and I could not perform <laughs> into this new world without having a basic understanding of it so I went to Georgetown and I learned for a little bit it was only four months but I learned about foreign policy and I learned about economics and I learned about political science and law all of the things that my training as a scientist didn't give me and one of the my classmates they were all non-scientists I was the only one and they the last day they gave me a note and they said look I would have never thought that scientists could do all these things I just imagined that they were like all day typing writing papers and I would never think that science should should and could be um, present in in our conversation he was a, a political scientist in such a way so I think um, bringing us together like this class is doing like this course is doing is what we need and we need more and I really want to congratulate you and thank you for uh, having me uh, be part of this so thank you Excuse me, you talked about the immense potential of connection, uh, connections, uh, the lack of collaboration between initiatives, and in a way, science diplomacy acts as a catalyst joining these initiatives despite the barriers that exist between them. There's a movement coming up that makes these connections between initiatives, people, institutions, uh, like a catalyst to overcome barriers and develop solutions for the betterment of mankind. Sorry for misusing this space for questions, but we'd very much like to have a word with you afterwards. Is that possible? Much obliged.
Yes, congratulations. Very good uh, presentation. My name is Ed Muso. I'm professor in the Energy Institute here in the university. And all these topics is very close to our business reality or scientific reality, as you want to say. Tell me if you would agree that if one side of the science diplomacy would be also things that in, we start seeing more in, intensively here in Brazil is when government start interfering in science when, especially when science is not speaking what the government want to hear. So would you call this as kind of uh, science diplomacy? I mean. Well, it's, it's, when we talk about a domestic, it, it's tricky, right? When we talk about a domestic relation between the government and the scientists, it's a domestic, so for me, when we use the word diplomacy, it's because it has an international dimension. But of course, every work that the scientist does has an international dimension. So a government not supporting or um, putting obstacles to the science of the domestic scientists, of course, impacts the ability of the scientists to work with the rest of the world. So absolutely, I mean, one of the challenges of the word science diplomacy, some of the negative con connotations and criticisms are about academic freedom and scientific freedom. So scientific freedom is the pillar of science. Without scientific freedom and academic freedom, you can't do science, right? So that's a principle. And then when we put the word diplomacy in it, some people think, oh, you are politicizing the science or you are using scientists as instruments and you're sending them to North Korea to take a picture and just do like a show. So it is a little tricky and also it is, but also in, in a way, it's good to remind us that the science comes first as an excellent, um, as a pursuit of an excellent knowledge and, and you know, it's, it's not about having two countries together for a picture and a flag and a handshake and say, and call it science diplomacy. It's about the project being real and the science being excellent first and foremost. And then the diplomatic apparatus can help, but what doesn't help is if you have a random project just because you want to do something between India and Pakistan and the science there is used as an excuse to have a photo op rather than have a real project engaging on the scientific issues. So scientists are very aware of this and they reject the politi politi being politicized or being called. So in the, the politicization it comes what you're, what you're asked when you're, when you're saying whether the government has a say or an interference on what should be researched or not, or what should be studied or not, or what words should be used or not, and whether the word climate change is allowed to be in documents or not anymore, right? So it is, it has, a, so even if it's a domestic issue, it has a huge international um, consequence, especially for a country like the US where this is happening, or a country like Brazil, because their science and their natural resources are important for the whole world. So um, then the other aspect of this that I can think of is the, um, the concept of science advice, which is very closely linked to science diplomacy. And it's about having, ideally, scientists and, and scientific evidence informing policy and, and the decisions. And so we're seeing that this is not anymore the case in many countries, and this um, is reversing. So many countries used to have science advisors to the president, to the foreign minister, to all sorts of uh, high figures, and now this is not happening anymore, meaning that science is no longer informing um, evidence. Uh, evidence is no, no longer informing policy as it should, and that is another worrying trend. So I think that's why I'm saying it's an optimistic, the science diplomacy is an optimistic story that is facing a very dark reality. And it's more important than ever because the world is kind of going in the other direction. So I think more of us need to be um, advocating and pushing for it. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Leah. I would like to ask your opinion about gender equity um, around the globe. I understand there are different levels of um, women being accepted um, around the globe, and what are the challenges you face in your daily 
life. Thank you. Great question. I actually saved one slide for just this question. Oh. <laughs> um, so, of course, we can talk about the status of women in general, but I think it's more accurate that we talk about the status of women in science, um, because otherwise we'll be here for I don't know how many years if we have to address the whole thing. So, of course, women in science reflect women in general, in meaning that we are underrepresented and we are discriminated, and we are still not in the same leadership positions than men. Despite women being more graduates in science these days, they still have a lack of representation at the top, right? So this is something that I'm, I care about. Um, I always, in my personal life and my, person, and my professional life, I always try to um, bring diversity both in my students, my speakers, gender balance always. I never speak in manuals. I encourage people to reject speaking in manuals. So there's some tools that you can implement to minimize a little bit this, because it's, it's such a huge challenge. But for me, it is about everybody taking um, individual action as well as structural big action um, as well. So one of the initiatives that I'm, I'm involved in is actually about bringing more women into environmental leadership. So we spoke about climate change as being the greatest challenge of our time, but what we have is leaders that either do not believe in it or reject it or they have other interests, right? So for me, this is not a crisis of the environment, or it's not a crisis of the climate, it is a crisis of leadership because in the end, the solution is here. We're just not using the solution because leaders refused and legislators refused, right? So what we have to do perhaps is to replace leadership. And there are studies that show that when more women are involved in decision making, decisions are usually more collaborative and more long term. Women bring a legacy mindset and more inclusion than men. Not that men don't, but when you have a higher um, ratio of women, for instance, in parliament, uh, this is associated with higher ratification of environmental treaties, for example, right? So bringing women, having a diverse, balanced uh, parliament or cabinet or anything is good for the environment. And so there's a project that um, I joined last year and I'm, I'm going to finish um, in November in a very special place, which is Antarctica, that is about that. It's a project that brings every year 100 women with a science background to Antarctica. And it's a boat with 100 women, it's a lot, three weeks. Imagine a boat with 100 women only. But this is to give you, it's a leadership program, and this is to give you the skills and the leadership tools and competencies to become a better leader at this science policy interface. And so the idea is if climate change is here and is really bad, we have the solution, but we're not implementing it, then the only solution, the only last uh, thing to do is to replace our leaders and bring new leaders that will believe in it and then they will implement what needs to be done. And so this program runs for 10 years. I'm going to go in November for in the fourth um, cohort. And at the end, it will have a thousand women that will have been trained in this leadership, environmental leadership um, program, and then they will be deployed to their countries and hopefully help turn this around. Um, so it's a program with 40 nationalities so far, um, and I think we are missing more from the southern hemisphere. So if anybody wants to apply, I would be very happy to talk to you about it as well. And it, it really is, it's a year-long program, but culminates in this three-week expedition to Antarctica and hopefully this will contribute a little bit uh, to, the, to solving that problem of, of gender equality and leadership and environmental sustainability as well. So there's a link there if you want to look, um, but I can also talk to you about it more if you want to go. I know Brazil has a good Antarctic program and it's um, something that you are also leaders in, so happy to talk more. Hi, uh, thank you very much for your talk. Um, uh, it, is, it is common sense that uh, science is universal, like scientific results are universal. 
but technology um, is like it's owned by it's dominated by some countries and innovations are corporate owned and uh, do you think uh, innovation diplomacy it's more challenging than science diplomacy because of um, production commercial uh, implications and what what are your thoughts about it please absolutely you're absolutely right and that's why this course having a track on science diplomacy and a track on innovation diplomacy it's also an innovative thing because usually science diplomacy course tend to be a lot more abstract and naive and then in when the innovation diplomacy comes in it's like the hard reality of ip and tech transfer and and all of the the trade barriers right so i myself look forward to to the discussions because it is a much harder thing to do as you as you say but also it involves a lot more hands-on the diplomats i mean the diplomats are trained very well trained in trade and in international um, commerce and in um, all of that much more than they are in the basic science so in the basic science it's about what writing papers finding something new and then publishing it and then writing a grant to get more money to keep doing the same thing and that is in the university in the research institute it's kind of still its own world it doesn't come to the real world of course it comes when it's visas and permits and we already talk about there are very real diplomatic elements to the pure research of the just the academic research but when it comes to the to the reality is when you have to deal with um, the tech transfer and, and all of the innovation diplomacy and the, the different collaboration models that exist. So I look forward to the to the parts of the program that will that will deal with that and the panels that uh, the, the the practitioners will will explain because and I think there's some in that we, there needs to be some innovative thinking in there too because some of those frameworks are a little bit outdated. And, and kind of rely on, on old frameworks as well of north-south of tech transfers and all of that. Um, and also new players, right? How China is also now coming in and, and, and changing a lot of those um, norms and rules. So very, very good question. And, very, and I myself look forward to, to learning more from the, from the second track. Hello, uh, my name is Diane. I uh, would like to ask you, um, in 2014, uh, New Zealand had an Ebola case and uh, they asked Australia uh, help, like testing uh, capabilities, for example. Um, a UK and Japan uh, have been cooperating to solve problems of Fukushima and other earthquake problems. So it seems that uh, Countries have been for a while cooperating using science to solve national problems, such as strategies and these sort of things. Uh, so what I ask is if you, if you believe that uh, diplomacy science now trying to make it in a more deliberate way, and well, if you believe um, what potential science diplomacy has now to increase such interactions using science through borders to solve problems uh, in a rate seen as never before? Yeah, perfect question. It is actually, yes, it is much more explicit right now. We have countries that are deliberately, as we saw, either launching an, an official government strategy for science diplomacy, which means that they are labeling things and they are dedicating resources in a way that before was only done implicitly or, or tacitly uh, but as you very well say when the uk was um, called for um, assistance in fukushima a very classic um, science diplomacy example perhaps it was not labeled like that right it was it's it's a, the, the i think the challenge is that the practice of science diplomacy has existed for many years but now we are labeling it so now we so we, we might think that is a different thing, but it's not. It's the same thing that we now give it a name and we make it with more purpose and we make it more explicit and we are more deliberate in, in the labeling, but it is not a new thing. The problem and the downside, I think everything has an upside and a downside. The, up, the downside is that things that are really not science diplomacy are labeled that. So there is a little bit of an over naming, 
I think, and that everything that is a science, international science, is labeled as science diplomacy. And I think the diplomats are very angry about it because they are, you know, rightly trying to to preserve the, the you know, the, the diplomatic part in the in the in the in the concept. And and you know, two scientists from random country writing a paper together is not diplomacy. But then you know, it, it's kind of a, a slippery slope of then it's public diplomacy and people to people and any interaction between any citizen between any country is diplomacy or not. And so the purists versus the you know new actors in science diplomacy, all of that is really um, I think shaking some and how, how do you call that ruffling some feathers in the traditional diplomats mindset. And and I don't know if that has been the same with the previous other diplomacies like the cultural diplomacy, like everything that has always been a new diplomacy if they have faced the same skepticism or is something that with science is more, this is a question for the diplomats, um, really, whether science diplomacy is more um, controversial or more, uh, or different from the other types of um, diplomacies. So, good question and I also, I mean, here I'm learning all, every day. That's why I'm, I'm saying I don't have a diplomacy training, so I'm learning every day. So sometimes I want to put the question on someone else, like a diplomat, <laughs> to answer. So, uh, Dr. Margaret Soler, thank you so much for uh, a very personal, but also very, uh, I would say, uh, global uh, presentations that you made. and. Uh, uh, we'll be happy to be for some weeks together and hopefully also after that. <laughs> <laughs>